Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar entitled Helping Staff Engage in Preference-Based Care. My name is Kendall Lesser and I am the Project Manager for Ohio's Pelican Project, which is aimed at promoting preference-based, person-centered care in Ohio's nursing homes. This work is done at Miami University in partnership with Penn State University and Tennessee Tech University. During today's webinar, we will be discussing recent research on staff perceptions about identifying and fulfilling resident preferences, as well as discussing a new tip sheet about helping staff engage in preference-based care. The handout for this webinar came with the registration materials, but you can also find it at the website link in the chat box to the right of your screen. When you click on the link for this handout, you will be asked to confirm that you wish to proceed to the website. Click on the Advanced button, which will allow you to proceed safely to the site. Before we get started with the presentation, I have a few housekeeping items to go over with you. I ask that for those of you seeking Ohio Social Work CEUs, which I believe can be transferred to nursing CEUs and or BELTA CEUs, to please take a moment and click on the link under the chat box and complete the form. I will place that link there now. Okay, it is very important that we have documentation of every single person who is requesting CEUs. So if multiple people are viewing this webinar on one computer, each individual person needs to sign into and out of the webinar, as well as complete the evaluation and post-test form at the very end. Again, we must have a record of you signing into and out of the webinar, and if you are requesting BELTA CEUs, you will also be required to take a post-test. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the Q&A chat box and we will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is part of a quarterly series we host on the topic of enhancing preference-based person-centered care in nursing homes. During these webinars, we will share our latest tip sheets, resources, as well as our latest research findings. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Kimberly Van Heitzma is an Associate Professor of Nursing at Penn State University, as well as the Director of, of the Program for Person-Centered Living Systems of Care and a Senior Research Scientist at the Polisher Research Institute at the Abramson Center for Jewish Life. Dr. Van Heitzma's research focuses on seeking to understand the impact of contextual issues such as the physical environment, culture of care, staff interactions, interdisciplinary team processes, and psychotherapeutic approaches on quality of life and quality of care delivery for frail seniors receiving services in long-term care settings. Our next presenter is Dr. Katie Abbott. Dr. Abbott is the Robert H. and Nancy J. Blaney Assistant Professor of Gerontology and the Scripps Gerontology Center Research Fellow at Miami University. Dr. Abbott's research and teaching focuses on preference-based person-centered care with a special emphasis on persons with dementia. Doctors Van Heitzma and Abbott have co-authored over a dozen peer-reviewed articles related to the PELI. I will now turn it over to Dr. Abbott. Thank you, Kendall. I appreciate that introduction. And um, before, we, before we get started, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about what we're going to do today in terms of uh, presenting some research. Um, on staff perceptions about how they identify and fulfill resident preferences. And we'll also go through a tip sheet where we give you some very practical advice um, in working with providers that we've heard from them as well as our research. And we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end too. And so as Kendall mentioned, please enter your questions here in the chat box. As we go, you can enter it throughout the webinar and at the end we'll come around back to them. And so, um, as Kendall also mentioned, we have other webinars that can be found at these links, and if you need anything, email us and we can send you the links as well. So we've done three webinars this year. Um, this is the fourth that will end for this fiscal year, um, and we'll have four more starting uh, July 1st. We wanted to give you just a quick overview of the advice that we provide today. Um, these recommendations are based on our experience and expertise of over 15 years of development, testing, and implementation of the PELI in, in various organizations. And so 
we want our goal is to assist providers in practicing preference-based person-centered care through developing action plans, policies and procedures, and formally formalizing how preferences are assessed, and then utilizing this information collected to enhance the care that every resident receives. So in terms of what we're talking about today, there's still much to learn from the perspective of staff members regarding their perceptions of facilitators and barriers that they encounter in their day-to-day -day work to honor resident preferences. These individuals are key stakeholders in delivering individualized preference-based care, and understanding their interpretations is critical, and they're a valued stakeholder that we need to hear from. And so, the purposes of our study, we wanted to understand what staff think of preference questions that we ask, how staff feel they've helped to meet resident preferences, the barriers that they've encountered when trying to meet preferences, and reasons staff perceive residents change their mind about preferences. And what, how we uh, conducted this study is that we talked to staff from a variety of disciplines, from social work, recreation therapy, dietary, CNAs at both the morning and afternoon shift, as well as professional nursing. And this was done in a 270-bed long-term care skilled nursing facility in the Pennsylvania area. You can see that we were able to speak with 36 staff members, most of which were female, 50% were African American, we had about 25% in the morning CNA shift, 22% in the evening shift. We had nurses, dietitians, rec therapists, and social workers rounding out the rest. And so as I mentioned, we, we asked them these four questions. So what do you think about the Pelly items? Describe an example of how you feel you've helped to do what a resident likes or prefers. And describe an example of when you were not able to do what a resident prefers. And describe a time when a resident changed his or her mind about the importance of a given preference. We audio recorded interviews and transcribed them, made sure that we were listening to them for accuracy, and we went through and coded these um, through a, a team-based um, exercise to make sure that we all were in agreement on the codes that we came up with to identify these common, common themes that we're going to present to you today. So the first theme that came up was when staff reflected on why it was important to ask nursing home residents their preferences, they had some very clear reactions. First, they said, well, it's to honor resident rights and to provide better care. Um, they wanted to be able to promote or support choice or control to ensure resident satisfaction with care, and they felt that this was a normal part of the human experience and should be done. And so, for example, I'll read you one quote uh, regarding the normalcy is that, quote, it's really no different than what my preferences are either. You know, I think when they come in here, we sometimes forget that they still have a, a life and that we just, it gets so busy and it's not putting down the staff, it's easier to go in and get your stuff and start providing care instead of asking them what they want. We forget they were something or somebody prior to coming here. They are not just old people waiting till their last day." End quote. And when we asked staff how they learned about resident preferences, there were three key avenues. So the first was through formal communication channels such as care planning meetings, software programs, or committees. They also learned about resident preferences through other people, such as family, other staff members, or even other residents. And they learned about resident preferences from the residents themselves, either through self-report, through observations in the care experience, or maybe past experiences. So for example, one of the quotes that came from that group on how you learn about resident preferences, you ask them. Or like if someone has dementia or something, you can tell by their reactions what they want and don't want. So like I said, if you take care of them every day, you ask them what they like and what they don't like, and you build a relationship and you go from there. So shifting to our next category, which was facilitators of preference fulfillment. So when we spoke to staff about ways in which they were able to help meet residents' preferences, 
Facilitators included staff behaviors, and these were things such as staff accommodating preferences, offering an opportunity or choice, adapting the activity to meet a resident's needs and abilities, advocating for the resident, anticipating a resident's needs, making oneself available to address the resident's preferences, educating residents or family, or gaining access to resources for the residents. Facility characteristics included things like the use of software, staff schedules, facility values, or the physical environment. The social environment also facilitated preference fulfillment, and these were things such as family support, staff relationships with the residents, the staff, the staff connecting residents with other residents, and respect. And finally, resident characteristics, things like health and functional status also facilitated preference fulfillment. So one quote from that group, cooking is a big preference on my household. So kind of the way that I have found ways to adapt it so that people can engage better. I've labeled the measuring cups with a little bit bigger font so people can read it. I assign appropriate roles for each person in the group based on what they can do. Whether it is this person can dry, can dry the measuring cups, this person measures things out, this person can stir, I try to match them with ability, but also with needs. So if someone has fine motor skills and needs to know, and needs to, <laughs> sorry, and needs to know to keep washing their hands, I see if I can get them to do tasks with fine motor skills. So then shifting to barriers that we, um, that the staff identified in terms of preference fulfillment, we found four major categories. And the first thing was really within the person, you know, the, the staff questioned their accuracy of knowing preferences, they might have had negative perceptions of the resident. They might have feel have, they might have a lack of control felt by the staff or timeliness. They just didn't feel like they had the time to be able to fulfill preferences. And in addition, facility characteristics such as policies restricting preferences, the resources not being adequate, scheduling restrictions, the just the nature of community living needing more time, having a different staff ratio, and safety concerns were major barriers to preference fulfillment. Again, the social environment was a barrier in the sense of, of resident lack of fit with others, the resident perception of lack of social peer networks, the lack of the resident feel, you know, having respect for the staff, or the fear of being fired. So staff were, were worried. And then also resident characteristics were barriers to preference fulfillment. So anytime a resident might have exhibited a behavior of distress, maybe their interest wasn't aligned, maybe they weren't feeling well, um, or those kind of status changes were barriers to being able, being able to fulfill preferences. And so we have one quote from that as an example. I, I think sometimes family can be a barrier. Like sometimes they want their mother or father to be up and out of bed, and sometimes the resident or patient doesn't want to. And sometimes they overstep that bounds of listening to their mom or dad. If they are awake, alert, and oriented, there's no reason they cannot make decisions for themselves. And sometimes families are too pushy, and it's not for the good of the mom or dad. It's actually doing more harm than good. And so as we uh, round up the sort of the findings of our study, understanding resident preferences was found by our staff to be reasonable and the right things to do. And staff learned from residents, family, and other staff members, and through paying attention to residents' actions and behavior. The electronic medical records can house information but may not be the most reliable and efficient for staff updates, especially if you're trying to communicate those preferences across different staff. Uh, staff perceive many more barriers to preference fulfillment than the facilitators, and resident characteristics led to difficulties in staff perceived ability to meet those preferences. Now, as with every study, we wanted to mention a few of the limitations of this particular study. 
These were staff perspectives gathered from a single five-star facility, as I mentioned, in the Pennsylvania region. Staff needed permission from their supervisor to participate in the study. And we had multiple methods of data collection. We did focus groups with some people, and we did individual interviews with others based on their schedules. And not all staff were represented. So for example, we didn't have the voices of housekeepers or environmental services in this study, which we consider important to providing person-centered care. And so finally, the implications of our work. We see that staff with more developed observational skills may be able to adapt care to resident preferences. Skills can be a focus for hands-on staff training in your organization. And including the direct care worker, workers in care planning meetings um, assists with communicating resident preferences and the discussion of successful strategies. And so there are lots of of strategies towards including direct care workers in care planning meetings. The Pioneer Network has a tip sheet on this on their website if you're interested in looking for that. Some people have suggested that you take the care planning meeting into the residence room with the direct care worker to have that meeting. And then finally, supporting staff in brainstorming ways to meet residents' preferences can empower staff to be thought leaders in person-centered care quality improvement efforts. And so at this point, I, I'd like to stop and just remind you that if you have any questions, to please enter your questions in the chat box. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Kimberly Van Heitsma, to go through our tip sheet. And as Kendall mentioned, it can be downloaded. Um, it would have come with the registration of the webinar, and it can also be downloaded on our website. All right, thanks, Katie. Um, so I'll say just a little bit about the, the tip sheet um, and its development. So we were um, very grateful to have funding from the Donahue Foundation to take the results of the previous study that uh, Dr. Abbott just reviewed and um, put them in front of a group of expert providers, our technical expert panel, that helped to take this, these research results and put them in this format of a tip sheet that really uh, helps to focus efforts on the part of um, staff and organizations that really want to engage in this journey of using preferences to deliver better person-centered care. So um, the tip sheet overall seeks to identify those steps, and there are five steps that help staff engage with, student, with residents about their preferences. Um, it provides some concrete strategies um, that are considered to be best practices in organizations uh, that are, are doing this work, and they very uh, generously shared with us their tips and ideas and best practices that you'll find in, in, this, web, in this tip sheet that we'll review. And um, strategies to start the conversation is uh, one of the, the uh, first points that we'll cover, as well as other ideas about how to communicate resident preferences. So the very first uh, out of the gate task is to start the conversation um, with staff members. And we do have other tip sheets that if you were a part of our webinars uh, previous to this, just to remind you that um, there are some steps uh, that take place prior to this uh, point which uh, emphasize the need to start with a champion, for example, and have a champion that is designated to sort of shepherd this process through um, your organization, um, and as well as some other tips in terms of starting small, starting on one unit that uh, may be or household that is your strongest performer in your organization, and involve all those levels of staff um, that have a stake in providing care, uh, such as you know direct care workers, activity therapists, social workers, housekeeping, um, all of the people that you saw that we engage as. Uh, participants in our research project, for example. Um, but once you have uh, taken those steps, then the next step would be to engage that small unit in the idea of a, a, a learning circle or a household meeting or a team meeting to discuss those things that um, we found uh, in our research were uh, reasons why it's important to ask about preferences. So the how of how we honor resident rights and provide better care, uh, promoting uh, choice and control, 
and uh, ensuring satisfaction with care. So these are questions that um, that champion could use to sort of kick off the conversation about uh, why are we doing this? Why are we looking at um, assessing preferences and fulfilling preferences for the people that we care for? And then um, in continuing that, the issue of how to make it work specifically for your own facility is within that uh, team meeting or learning circle to actively explore ways of how, how do we know the way a resident likes to live her, her daily life. And that may lead to, again, a very productive conversation about observing um, uh, how people react in, in situations as a way of knowing their preferences, for example. It's a great forum for discussing how you're currently assessing resident preferences. In nursing homes, of course, we know everybody does uh, the MDS Section F. So everybody is assessing preferences in some way, shape, or form. Um, and uh, how, how you're doing that is something that would be very productive for this group to, uh, to talk about together, and as well as ways of how they think they may be able to do the, it even better than what uh, the, is currently being done in the organization. So exploring in step two, how staff can go about learning more about resident preferences. So here is, again, some, a list of things that could be uh, discussed in that learning circle, which is, well, we learn about our resident preferences through our daily interactions with residents and uh, ongoing conversations with residents and their family, their friends. Um, we also, of course, learn about uh, the resident preferences through the process of care planning and the ongoing management of, of the, the person's plan of care. And then finally, uh, the additional step of, of adding in a formal assessment, such as the uh, preferences for everyday living inventory, is something that can be discussed and reviewed um, in that uh, learning circle and team meeting. And having a copy of the PELI there to sort of talk about um, how this might be a vehicle for uh, learning more about a resident would be another option to pursue. So once you have sort of started that conversation, explored ways of how we can learn more about preferences, then the next step would be to develop a process of how you're going to communicate what it is you know about that resident. And Katie already mentioned the critical step of involving direct care workers in care plan meetings. Um, and of course, the increased emphasis of having direct care workers in those care planning meetings from a survey perspective is, is um, coming down the pike, um, as well as just we know that when we do involve direct care workers in care planning meetings, it results in much better care. Um, there's also other, uh, these other examples that you see on here that uh, providers are, have shared with us. So creating an all about me board uh, for uh, each resident um, as a way of learning more about um, the, those, that particular individual's preferences um, and taking information from the PELI or from observations or from family member report that could go on that all about me board. Um, resident preferences can also be shared uh, on daily uh, from because uh, we do know that resident preferences do change uh, from time to time. And it may change depending on the particular day that the resident is having, if they're having a bad day or a good day. Um, so the idea of sharing them in a round or a huddle um, is, is something that um, some organizations are using with great uh, benefit where you're able to uh, just create that as another topic within the round or the huddle that you're using as a, a, a moment to share about what that person's preference uh, may be in reminding staff or gaining or getting information about that for more detailed information about that person's preferences. Um, some facilities are embedding um, this preference information in their electronic uh, medical records and uh, producing uh, those types of reports from the, the medical records that helps to drive the care plan process and have that preference information immediately available for um, entering into and refining the, the person's plan of care. 
And then finally, uh, we've seen uh, facilities use the resident profile cards uh, which uh, to great effect where it's a laminated card where the uh, resident preference information is placed on the card uh, and is something that goes with the resident, perhaps put on their wheelchair or on a walker or uh, placed prominently within uh, the, the resident's room as a way of uh, quickly referencing what that person's uh, preferences may be, in particular preferences related to activities. Um, the, the process, again, can't be emphasized enough of including all staff, environmental services, maintenance, house, housekeeping um, uh, included, uh, because everybody has a stake in um, not only understanding people's preferences, but seeking to fulfill them. All right, so uh, the ongoing step of um, encouraging staff, so now providing ongoing motivation, support um, to honoring resident preferences. Uh, here you uh, may want to uh, support the development of observational skills uh, to help adapt care to resident preferences. So part of what um, can be focused on is again, encouraging, supporting, rewarding um, those staff that happen to be particularly adept at um, uh, observing, keenly observing what a resident likes or does not like and what their preferences or aversions may be. Um, supporting staff to brainstorm uh, ways to meet resident preferences. Again, we may do that on a, as we mentioned, in a daily huddle or a rounding process where the um, uh, encouragement to think outside of the box um, is really supported and becomes a part of the, the daily process of encouragement and support uh, to staff focused around preference fulfillment. And then uh, ongoing encouragement of flexibility and creativity um, and developing new strategies to address preferences. As Katie mentioned, you know, there are a lot of barriers to meeting uh, people's preferences. Some of them are a part of the individual themselves. It's hard to meet a preference for someone who uh, has advancing cognitive impairment or advancing sensory impairment or functional impairment. And it requires us to really be, um, not to give up, but to be very creative in uh, seeking new and different ways of continuing to honor those preferences as that person's abilities uh, may change over time. And then, of course, the uh, process of listening and responding uh, to staff concerns. Um, staff uh, are doing a very hard job and a, the feeling heard and feeling that their, response, uh, their concerns are being listened to and addressed is incredibly important to maintain their well-being as they go about this really difficult work of, of trying to fulfill the preferences of the many, many people that they're uh, caring for and the, the um, stress that can be associated with, with doing that. So engaging in a really open and honest dialogue about uh, what problems we can anticipate and certainly our list of barriers that we presented earlier are things that I think are not, um, uh, would be anticipated that would be not in just the one large facility we were in, but would be in uh, potential issues in many facilities as well as um, presenting some of the solutions we have here. But again, the uh, encouragement to even look for new creative solutions that are uh, targeted to your own organization's culture and milieu are really important. And then that routine check-in um, to address the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, concerns uh, is, is really critical. So as we've gone along, as I said, we've inter talked with uh, many providers and many um, organizations about you know, how they go about um, uh, seeking to fulfill people's preferences. And these are just some of the common frequently asked questions that, that we've encountered. So um, for example, will asking residents about their preferences increase our workload? And the answer is yes. 
Um, it will because when you, it's an additional um, task uh, to be done uh, throughout the day. But again, the idea that this, the uh, avoidance of trying to make this an entirely task-based activity. This should be, and encouragement should be given that this is a relationship-based um, uh, activity. It's an opportunity and time to get to know the resident, and so, and it doesn't have to be uh, completed in one setting, and in fact, should be encouraged to do over the course of time so that it's not burdensome on either the staff or the residents who are being asked these questions. And the beauty of uh, after you ask the questions and begin to the process of uh, sincerely seeking to uh, fulfill those preferences is that residents uh, report feeling happier, um, they, their well-being and their satisfaction go up, which make life easier for staff. So residents who feel they are not being heard or their preferences are not being met uh, can become more demanding as a, a result of their dissatisfaction. And so uh, asking people up front about their preferences and uh, seeking to uh, honor those preferences can actually lighten the load of the staff over time as that culture of relationship building and honoring preferences um, develops um, uh, as the organization continues to work toward that goal. Another question is, are we raising expectations for care that cannot be met? Um, so I think it's natural to worry that residents uh, may make impractical or uh, overly demanding requests, yet it is, in our experience, very rare that um, those types of requests are made. More often, resident preferences are very realistic, and in fact, if anything, I think many people feel um, reluctant to share their true preferences uh, because they feel like it's being too demanding or it's just simply not possible, you know, in this environment. So uh, the, uh, the opposite is actually uh, what most people encounter in terms of this fear about uh, raising ex expectations. The next question that comes up is how do you prioritize uh, resident preferences? And, that, and again, some residents have many, many preferences and some have few. Um, so if you are providing care to a resident who doesn't have really all that many important preferences, they say, uh, you know, what's really important to me is that I get up at eight o'clock in the morning and, you know, I have my coffee. That's, if I have that, if I get my day started in that way, I'm good to go. Whereas another resident may have many, many preferences and say that there are many things that are important to them uh, over the course of the day. And so prioritizing those uh, uh, multiple preferences can be challenging. So for example, when six residents in a household indicate that it's important for them uh, to go to bed by 10 p.m. and we have only two staff members assigned to this um, a group to uh, meet that need, or oftentimes more realistically, one staff member uh, to assign to meet that need. Um, it can be very difficult to, uh, and if not impossible, to meet that uh, preference to the letter. However, if again, through the process of empowering staff and encouragement of staff to address the issue head on and think creatively along with the residents and their family members, you can uh, get to a successful outcome. So you could hold a neighborhood meeting to specifically discuss this dead bedtime dilemma uh, and uh, an outcome often is that some will say, well, you know, it's important for them to be asleep by 10 p.m., but, you know, they're willing to go to, into bed at 9.30. Um, and when discussing among the, the folks who had the same preference, you may find it's actually a nice relationship building exercise among the residents who seek to um, help to uh, meet each other's needs um, by having that discussion. So when staff and residents collaborate, the sky's the limit. They can really devise very inventive and creative ways to fulfill preferences that on the face of it would uh, initially be considered to be impossible to do. 
And then what about family members? Um, we already saw, you already saw in our work um, that family members sometimes um, can uh, be great aids to the whole process of figuring out what preferences are, especially for people who are maybe too cognitively impaired to share their preferences themselves. We have to rely on those family members to give us a, a sense of how the person uh, liked to uh, live their life and what their preferences were before they lost the ability to share it with us um, verbally. Um, but on the flip side, we also have uh, family members who sometimes have differences of opinion about how to meet a person's preference that may be different from even the resident themselves, uh, what, what they would like. So again, talking with the family to directly address these issues and resolve differences can lead to a much improved effective caring partnership where all parties feel heard and it, everybody has a, uh, a stake in uh, helping to devise a plan of care that is um, doable and is, um, uh, seeks to, again, keep the resident at the center uh, of the uh, care delivery process. All right, so I think we're, um, we're at a stopping point here and um, we will uh, entertain questions uh, in the chat box, so please enter your, your questions um, and we'll address them one at a time. And another, if you don't have a question, we would invite you to share a practice uh, that you use to help staff engage uh, in preference fulfillment uh, or the process of assessing preferences that we've not discussed up until this point. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. And while we're giving you a chance to enter your questions, we wanted to give you uh, a little heads up about some upcoming events. We will be presenting at the Pioneer Network Annual Conference um, in Rosemont, Illinois on Monday, July 31st. And we're, we're doing a, a half-day workshop that we call Pelly Boot Camp. And so Foundation for Implementing Preference-Based Person-Centered Care Across Long-Term Services and Supports. So if you'll be there, please stop by and say hi. And also we wanted you to save the date. Um, November 9th in Columbus, the Ohio Person-Centered Care Coalition will be um, hosting a, a person-centered care conference and it will offer six continuing education credits for $150. It's going to be at the Bridgewater Banquet Center. And as soon as we have registration information, we will pass that along in one of our newsletters. Um, but this is going to be a great one-day event um, that's completely focused on uh, person-centered care. As we've alluded to, uh, we really seek to create an opportunity um, for you to interact um, and learn with one another by sharing your successes and stumbles. And so uh, Kendall and I, that, that you heard from earlier, we are continuing. We've had a great success visiting lots of different organizations and basically just hearing from you about what you're doing, what's working, what's not working. Um, we, we really enjoy that. And so again, if you um, would like to invite us to your organization, we would love to come and spend an hour or two to, to hear um, what you've been doing and, and see if we might be able to problem solve creatively with you. And so you can see um, Dr. Lesser's email and phone number there to schedule a day or time. So we will be offering, and what we're trying to do right now is put together all of the dates and times for the upcoming year. So we'll start our next year, July 1, and our first webinar that we'll offer in our second year will be um, about how to, how to integrate preferences into care planning. And so we're going to be hosting that on September 28th from 2 to 3 p.m. So you know, hold the, put a little, you know, calendar hold on your, on your Google Calendar right now. And then as soon as we have the registration information and tip sheet ready, we will upload those for you to, to utilize. Um, and we've, we've got some exciting things that we're, that are going to be coming out too. Um, we just completed filming a video um, that can, it's about 22 minutes long, that you can use with um, training staff or even volunteers on how to conduct PELI interviews. And so we'll hope to release that um, this summer. 
And in order to hear about all of these things, please sign up for our monthly newsletter. And you can do that with this link. And I think Kendall will be able to copy and paste this link into the chat box so you'll be able to click on it. I know it's, it's, it's <laughs> hard to not be able to click on our, on our screen slides. But again, if you, if you have trouble, um, please uh, email us and we can get you on our newsletter. We send one newsletter out a month. And, and also another alternative is to go to the website and go to the Contact Us um, link, and uh, also that provides another way for, for you to, uh, to get onto our newsletter uh, list. Perfect. Yeah, and so we, have, um, we are rolling out a new website, preferencebasedliving.com, and right now, as Kendall mentioned, you'll, you'll see a, a little, uh, a different screen that comes up. Click the Advanced tab to continue onto the site, and you'll be able to see all of the resources that we've talked about in our, pre in our previous webinars as well as today's webinar. And then we also want to hear from you. Um, we have a helpline that you can get right to us, and if you're having a struggle with something, please let us know. Um, we love difficult issues. We love trying to put our heads together and come up with some uh, ways that you might be able to remediate some barriers. Um, but, but in essence, we, we, uh, we want to hear from you. So please, reach out and let us know. Um, and I see Kendall posted on the chat box the link to sign up for the, web, for the newsletter. Um, and so we want to thank you. And then we'll turn to some questions here. And I see that... Um, Kendall, let me turn it back to you to make sure that I haven't missed another one. I see one, but let me see if I've missed any others. Yes, so um, there's one about if you could speak a little bit about HIPAA and the PAL cards and um, how that works, as well as if you could speak a little bit about residents' rights if um, they don't want to have a PAL card or how do you handle that even if it is HIPAA compliant. So I will let you both speak a little bit about HIPAA and the Cards. That's an excellent question. Um, and so what we what we haven't, Kimberly is sort of giving a little a little forecast into something that we're we can't wait to share with you. We're we're still trying to finish up um, the implementation tip sheet to share with you, but we have um, worked in collaboration with a with a local organization to develop what we've called a PAL card, which means simply preferences for activity and leisure. <laughs> And so for, and, and if I'm able to, I'll see if I can pull up a, a, a picture of it. Um, I'll give my response and then what, maybe why Kimberly's talking, I can pull up a picture for you. In essence, the PAL card um, has on one side, it's like a five by seven card. On one side, it has the resident's name and a little mini bio. And on the opposite side has some of their important preferences for leisure and recreational activities. And so, in the design, we have been very careful to avoid any kind of reference to something, for example, as a falls risk. There's nothing on these cards that um, would violate HIPAA privacy. And so the way they're constructed, and again, we will release this um, this summer to you, and we, again, we have a template that you can download to, to plop in information for, you know, based on your residence. We have an implementation guide that we'll release to you too. So we'll be providing these resources to you. Um, and the way we have it constructed right now will not violate HIPAA. However, if you were to use this material maybe for personal care or for other types of preferences, you may need to think through that a little bit more. And we can also, um, if you have specific questions, we can reach out to the Ohio Department of Medicaid um, privacy officer to ask more specific questions. And Kimberly, maybe you can answer, and I'll see if I can find a picture of the PAL card. Yeah, so um, again, the, the, the information that is on these cards that you'll see that Katie brings up is um, uh, deliberately focused around activities. And again, the thought was uh, that these were the types of, uh, of information that staff can look at a glance to see what a topic of conversation might be or what type of, of short uh, activity might be done uh, relative to that person's uh, preferences. 
So uh, the example that uh, Katie put up here is for Harold, and um, this is a, uh, the boxes here are templates that you would be able to fill in with your, your own residence um, information. So the gray box on the right uh, reflects uh, Harold's sort of short bio um, and his background and again, uh, things that he, activities that he likes and enjoys uh, doing. And then on, that's on the front of the card. And then on the back of the uh, card are the specifics that we've learned from our conversation through uh, using the Pelly uh, with Harold. Uh, so here for Harold, we can see that he has uh, five important preferences around religion, socializing, sports, dogs, TV, and music. And the specific examples underneath each of those are gathered from listening uh, to Harold tell us the specifics about uh, the preferences in each of those areas. And one thing that we'll, we'll mention is that we were doing these with um, mild to moderately cognitively impaired individuals. And after we created, after we completed the interview and created the card, we went back to show the card to the individual and um, asked, you know, where would, you know, first of all, is it accurate? And second of all, where would they like it placed? And so we did this with consent of the resident. The resident could refuse to do this, of course. Most of the responses, and we've done about 35 of these now, most of the residents that we have talked to have been delighted to have this information. We initially thought it would be a mechanism for fill-in staff to learn something quickly about a resident, but we quickly found out that residents were reading each other's cards and they were having a lot of fun with it. Um, and so again, we're, we're, um, this is a little uh, you know, forecast into something that we want to share with you, but of course, in terms of residents' rights, they do not have to have one and they should have a voice in where they would like it placed. We have had it in many different places, as, Kendall, uh, as Kimberly mentioned, on the back of a wheelchair, on, on, you know, attached to a walker. It could go um, to, on the door, you know, in, you know, to the side of the door to the residence entryway of their, of their um, room. Um, what, we're, what we're trying to avoid is this um, idea that it goes in a binder and is put on a shelf somewhere because what we've realized and, and heard from providers is that then people don't have the information when they need it. So we want to keep this information as close to the resident as possible so that the person, that it's, it's right there for somebody to access when they need it. They don't have to stop and say, who is that? All right, let me go get the binder and see what Harold likes to do so I can come in and have a conversation with him or find out if he'd like to go outside with me for a little bit. And so I think that that's something that, um, again, um, we want to hear from you. Um, we'd love to hear your, your thoughts about this process. Again, we want to build this together. And so please, you know, let us know if, um, what you think. And as I mentioned, we'll be rolling out the template and the um, implementation tip sheet um, as soon as we have those ready to go. We also have what we're hoping to, to send out to you soon is a, a little brochure that you can provide to your residents on why you're going to be asking about pre preferences. So a lot of times we hear from residents, why do you want to know this? And so we have a little brochure that you can share with your residents and family members about why preferences matter and, um, you know, why they're going to be asked about their, prefer about their preferences. Did you have anything to add on that, Kimberly? Yeah, and again, I think, you know, you're hearing about a lot of these materials that were, have developed, will continue to develop. Um, what past webinars uh, that we've given, um, all at uh, tip sheets that we've uh, discussed and, and previous webinars and are available. So the Pelly assessment tools, the tip sheets, uh, the webinars, all of these uh, resources are headed toward our website and will be uh, made available on that website for an easy download. Uh, for you at that, uh, at that one-stop shop uh, location. Um, and again, we just ask your patience as we continue to uh, construct that website and get it uh, ready to roll. Great. Um, yeah, everything's a little bit of a 
a work in progress, it seems like sometimes. Um, and so we've got a new question that looks like has come in. Let me read this one. Why are many of the questions on the Pelly interview repetitive? This makes the whole interview process very lengthy, which is a disadvantage for a successful interview because many of our residents are cognitively impaired with short attention spans. Thank you for that question. Yeah, that's a, that is a very common um, question that we get. And, and again, the, first of all, the process of doing the PELI, especially if you're doing the, the full interview, which we encourage uh, because it gives so much information that the staff and the care planning team can really utilize to create very rich and individualized care plans, uh, does make for a very long interview, especially if you're looking at it from the perspective of doing it all in one sitting. Uh, with somebody who has some cognitive impairments, it makes it even more challenging. So uh, one strategy that we encourage is that um, uh, it not be attempted in one sitting, instead uh, looked at as an opportunity to get to know a person and be uh, the questions be asked over time as a normal part of uh, the flow, ebb and flow of the day so that it is not uh, something that you would sit down and power your way through come, uh, you know, come what may that you're trying to get to, uh, to the end of that uh, interview. Um, from a also from an answer perspective, remember that if a person says that a preference is not important to them, there is no need to talk any more about it. Um, so any of the additional uh, items about specific preferences underneath that, uh, if I say that uh, uh, it's not important for me to be around animals such as pets, um, that ends that discussion then uh, around anything related to pets. However, um, if I ask Katie that question and she says, oh, yes, it's very important for me uh, to be around animals such as pets, then we would go on to have a more in-depth uh, conversation around that particular preference. Um, from a cognitive impairment perspective, there are some tips that uh, we can suggest in terms of making the interview process a little e easier. Um, so right now, the PELI is set up to be, have a response set that matches what is on the MDS Section F, which is to ask how important uh, this preference is and then have a response set of four different, it's very important, somewhat important, not very important, not important at all, or important but can't do. And uh, anybody who's conducted interviews with people who have cognitive impairment recognize that sometimes it's very hard for uh, people to answer those types of detailed response sets. So there is a process called unfolding, which you can use um, as to get at the very same information, but you generally ask a general question about, is it important to you or not important to you? And once you have determined whether it's important or not important, then you can ask, well, is it very important to you or somewhat important to you? So that process of only giving two choices at any given time is referred to as unfolding and can be very useful in, uh, uh, as a strategy for interviewing people um, with, with cognitive impairment. But again, the take home message is to um, not ask uh, all the questions in one sitting and uh, to take your time uh, in terms of uh, designating um, those items that uh, a person uh, can tolerate or as long as they're enjoying the interview. Maybe that's the criteria that you can use for when to continue and when to, uh, when to stop uh, the interview process at any given point. And I've pulled up on the screen our first tip sheet, which again is, is on the website. And some of the ideas here are that um, if you look under step two, is looking at the 72 questions from the full pelly, you might select 10 or 15 to start with. Um, again, and, and maybe prioritize, and maybe you want to start out with recreation and leisure items and just start with those, and then maybe in another month or two start to ask some of the other questions just so that it doesn't feel like um, you have to do all 72 in that one setting, as Kimberly mentioned. 
And so um, another idea is to focus on your 16 MDS items and ask those follow-up questions in the full PELI if someone does have an important preference that can inform the care plan. Um, and then other ideas that, we've, that have been suggested is that you have departments divide up the PELI questions by discipline. So as a team, decide on the items to ask. So activities might ask activities questions. And you know, nursing might ask the personal care questions and so on. So there are some, hopefully those are some strategies um, for, for um, you know, approaching the PELI interviews. 